everyone. Here we are again. Another week is down. Welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Dotsie Vouch, and I'm here with guess who? Alexander Paul. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My girl. Uh, well, we're pretty excited about our guest today. And uh, <laughs> you are um, the animal rights activist that I look up the most in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of the wide variety of ways that you are willing to attack the issues for animals. Um, you definitely don't stay in any specific swim lane. <laughs> I can say that for sure. You're a good swimmer. Um, so you could. Um, but as, it, as this, um, as your, you know, animal activism um, has grown and matured over the years because you've been doing it for a very long time, uh, the conversation uh, often comes up for us uh, and, and certainly for you in all these years that you've been doing it so much longer than I have, um, the conversation around elf, animal welfare versus animal rights. Um, you've done a lot of work for animals uh, that get getting tested for cosmetics and also, um, you know, back when they're when, when circuses were, a, you know, a, a popular thing to to go to. And you have a you have a story um, that traverses this conversation about animal welfare versus animal rights that I want you to share. Yeah, I might have shared it on the podcast before, but it bears repeating because I think a lot of people can probably relate I went down to a city council meeting in downtown Los Angeles that was trying to stop, um, I, you know, actually, don't, it was to, I think it was to free an elephant from the L.A. Zoo and to stop circuses from coming to L.A. because of the animals, specifically elephants. It was focused on elephants. And I was in the, and there was a, there were a lot of, animal lovers there at the city council meeting. And I was in the camp where no more elephants in captivity, uh, no more elephants in captivity in LA, either whether it's zoos or circuses or anything. And there was another camp that was just asking the city council to ban bull hooks in LA. And I thought that was just like, what? You're going to keep them captive and you're just not going to use a bull hook? A bull hook is a, a long weapon, essentially, that has a, a, a hook on it that trainers and uh, anybody who's keeping an animal, the uh, elephant in captivity, has to have to keep, to move that elephant forward to manage that elephant. And the elephants are trained from the get-go, which we learned from our episode um, on elephants with Allison, uh, that to be terrified of the bu the bull hook, mm -hmm. but I still thought all you're doing is asking them to get rid of bull hooks. They'll find something else, and then but and the animals will still be in captivity. Well, in the end, of course, city councils being city councils, they did not ban elephants in captivity in L.A. No, they simply banned the bull hook, and I was really upset. I I considered it a loss, but what happened was is that circuses went out of business because they the banning of this bull hook became nationwide in so many areas that the circuses realized that they couldn't control elephants without the bull hook therefore they weren't going to try to control them at all and they weren't going to hold them hold them captive and there are still elephants at the LA zoo but um, it did go a long way to freeing elephants this what i thought was an animal welfare um, action was really an animal rights action. And that taught me that small steps, which I always thought, w had, had hitherto thought, well, those are just wimpy. You know, what are we doing? Um, can have huge effects. And that's why I'm so excited about our guest today, because mm -hmm. she is an animal rights activist, like the two of us, but she's taken a lot of animal welfare steps that have animal rights ramifications. Mm -hmm. And your your theory about needing both um, is important, I think. I, ha I have always had this theory that every kind of activism is important, especially when it comes to animals. They need all the, the human help that they can get to mm -hmm. break free from the bonds that humans have put them in. Um, so whether you are a social media activist, a uh, writing checks activist, a getting the cages bigger activist or a getting arrested activist, sign holding activist, there's so many ways to be active 
they all are valuable. Mm -hmm. They really are. And we can talk today about what our guest feels if there's, she's chosen certain paths and why. And, um, but yeah, I do feel it's really important that we all honor everybody's path. And mm -hmm. that bull hook thing, you know, was just really uh, humbled me because I realized that, yeah, I was honoring the other path and by, you know, saying everyone should be just, as long as everyone's doing their thing, it's fine. But in my head, I was really like, oh, those bullhook people, they're not going to get anywhere. And yeah. here they are. They want it for us, in terms of circuses, at least. High five on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the segue. Because, yes, everyone, we have uh, Leah Garces on our show today. And she is, well, she's an activist at her core mm -hmm. in every way, shape, and form. She's smart, strategic, most importantly, empathetic to every single being, even those humans who exploit animals. Uh, she uh, once ran Compassion in World Farming, which is more of an animal welfare organization, uh, and is now the president of Mercy for Animals. Um, she leads a massive organized effort uh, to end suffering by the way, uh, the, by the way of animal agriculture. Uh, in her book, Grilled, uh, which we both read before this interview. Um, she goes uh, really deep, and she turns activism on its head uh, with this with this book that came out uh, just last year. Uh, it it mainly documents her work with chicken farmers and corporations to bring about positive change, and her TED talk, turning adversaries into allies, really couldn't explain it better. So if for somehow we don't do a good job in this next hour, please go watch her TED talk because it's extraordinary. Uh, wow, we are so honored to have you on today. Welcome, Leah. Oh, thank you. It's my honor. I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm giddy. I'm giddy. I have to. Good. Tell you. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Um, well, before we dive in uh, into your activism and your story and um, all that we are going to talk about as it relates to, to, to chickens and the work that you've done, uh, I think that it's possible throughout today uh, in, in, in speaking about the work that, 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 that the, the beings that we're speaking about could possibly come across as um, objects, right? Because we're going to talk about the progress and we're just going to keep saying chickens, chickens, chickens. I want you first to open this up. Please tell us about these creatures that you've spent a large part of your life fighting for. Oh, this is my, I get a podcast where I get to talk about chickens. <laughs> this is a dream come true for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's like early, early holidays. Um, well, anyone who knows me knows how much I love chickens. I am like the chicken lady is my other name. Um, chickens are amazing. They are often misconstrued as bird brained and not smart. Um, in my book, I talk about how my husband and I are upset because at some point we watched Moana and the the silly chicken in there is the one that walks off the boat and is the, the you know the bird brain. And this is the cultural usual depiction of chickens, but actually it's very misinformed. And chickens are great problem solvers. Uh, there are experiments done, not invasive ones, where they're given obstacle courses and tests where they have to complete something because they want to either get to food or lay a nest. And they'll be very creative in doing this. They'll pull strings and run over. They're like Olympians, like you. You know, they'll do these fantastic things that seem impossible. They also have incredible eyesight. They can see from far away and close at the same time. Oh, wow. And they can... Uh, Oh, they can orient themselves in the magnetic field of the earth, which feels like some kind of superpower to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They also have incredible empathy, so which is hard to think. A chicken has empathy, but really most animals that have a mothering instinct or are mothers have empathy because in order to be a mother and hear the call of their young, they're going to have to understand Fear. So one experiment that was done with a, a behaviorist, which was fantastic, was um, they would do these little puffs of air on the chick 
And the chick would go beep, 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 and make this distressing noise. And then the mother would come and, and try to comfort the chick. And pretty soon they realized all they had to do was bring out this, this puffer and it would result in the mother getting distressed and going to protect. And it's very similar to example for when we take our kids to get shots and the shot comes out and there's real visceral reaction coming from the parent. And this is empathy. This is what empathy looks like. This is how we measure empathy. And, and it's no wonder that chickens are depicted in childhood stories as always with a, you know, a bunch of chicks running behind them, empathetic. I think that the, the, the sad thing is people think they're not smart. I have a pet chicken. Her name is Henrietta. Mm -hmm. I adore her. And Henrietta, just this morning, for example, we were watching her and we thought, um, what is she doing? She's always knocking over her food. She has this little thing. And when it gets to the bottom, she knocks it over and we're like, Henrietta, what are you doing? So I went and held it this morning and I realized she was doing it on purpose. She was pulling it over because she wanted to dump the food out and get it. So she's problem solving. I could talk about chickens all day long. They're affectionate, they're sweet, they're smart, they're problem solving. I'll stop here because this is only an hour podcast and we have plenty to get through. I want, first of all, I want a Henrietta so I had so a Henrietta bad. chicken when I was a kid. You, you did? did? Yeah, yeah, we named her Henrietta. Yes. Really? Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I feel like I could I feel like I could make that happen. Um I, I spent a lot of time on the East Coast at Indraloka Animal Sanctuary. And when I first got to know chickens, uh gosh, 70 of them were rescued from rescued from a Caporo festival. You know, so they're all pretty much all babies. They're quite young. And uh, they come in and, and uh, I said, okay, if you want to go hang out with them, you know, you can go in where they all are, but you got to put the hazmat suit on because, you know, they had to quarantine from the other animals, the sanctuary. So I go head to toe, I mean, hood, boots, the whole thing in, in, in my hazmat suit. And I just sit down in the corner um, and there's, you know, there's 50 or 60 of them. It might have been more. And that was my first experience with the, um, <sighs> just the, amazing amount of the variety of personalities because of course they had lots of different personalities but I just never really thought about it I was like you know I knew they were smart and empathetic and interesting and you know could problem solve but I I just didn't think about all their different personalities and because of what they'd been through that you know, they had just gotten there so they had very different feelings about me a, a human so some wouldn't come anywhere near me right like they wouldn't even really come out of their shed to the open area where I was but behind the, the the wire um but some of them were extremely curious but weren't going to get too close but so they were just kind of like around you know that whole crew then there was this this very I think introverted crew that uh they wanted desperately to feel something uh and something good probably uh, but they just didn't quite have that outgoingness. And so they were kind of pecking and coming back, pecking, you know. And then there was the, there there were the extroverts. And I'm not an extrovert, so I know one when I see one. And there was maybe six of them that literally could not get close enough to me. They were just desperate for, Oof. I think, just, just, just love and comfort. And they're just in my net. I mean, you know, they, they, we hadn't even said hello, nice to meet you. And they were just trying to almost get inside of me. They needed Aww, it so much. That sounds lovely. But that way, it was definitely a lovely experience. But they're, they're just, um, I, I couldn't believe the variety of the personalities. Mm. Yeah. Leah, tell us about, um, we're talking about chickens as individuals mm -hmm. um, because we love animals, but the, the systems in America do not necessarily love animals. Tell us about the history of chicken eating in America so that our listeners have an understanding of how it's evolved over the years. Absolutely. Uh, so chicken has really only become this central part of our diet in the last few decades. And before that, chicken was chickens as they were roasted on a Sunday. And it was a special meal that people ate maybe once a week. And what's more is the chickens that people used to eat were raised for dual purposes, laying eggs and their meat. So they might lay eggs for a while. And then once that became something that the family didn't want them to do in the backyard anymore, then they would kill them and roast them. So it was a once, you know, an occasional special thing, mm -hmm. but 
there came a time in around the in around the depression where we started to really mechanize and speed up and become more efficient in the production of chickens. Two things happen. One is the they started to selectively breed for chickens that laid eggs versus the ones that were for meat. So they discovered there were strains that were really good at laying eggs and strains that were really good for eating. And they started separating and selectively breeding. And the way that we selectively breed for dogs, like for particular characteristics, like a certain type of hair or feature personality. Well, they were specifically for meat chickens, only selecting for breast meat because that is the type of meat that Americans like to eat. And that just got worse and worse. They just kept selecting and selecting and selecting until they had essentially what we have today, which is a Franken chicken. This is, and I hate to say that because it demonizes the chicken, it's the industry, but there's no better way to describe. The, and if these chickens have very, very wide breasts, they wobble, they can't walk. The chickens we eat today are killed at six weeks of age. Many people don't realize that they're babies. And just by comparison, a chicken raised for meat will not lay eggs till five or six months. So these are real babies, not mature at all, but they're large enough to facilitate our protein consumption. And unfortunately, the birds are very resilient. And that is in a way they're sad for them because they can survive in these horrific conditions, very crowded. And this led to a rapid increase of production where we went from very few farms raising backyard birds to bigger farms raising more birds to then fewer farms raising tons of birds. And right now in the United States, we raised 9 billion meat chickens only. They're called broilers per year, they're raised and slaughtered. And we're eating over 20, as, as Americans, we're eating over 20 birds a year, each American, if, and, and you know none of us eat chickens, so somebody else is eating our batch. And it's shocking. And the consumption has gone from a, a roast on a Sunday shared by a family to each person eating 20 chickens a year. It's, it's a exponential growth of our consumption. And today in history, sadly, more chickens are being raised and killed than ever before in history. Yeah. We're at an all time high yeah. of production and consumption. And if the industry has well, its way, there will be more. Yeah, well, so, so, so going back to we raised, you know, just had a roast on a Sunday to where we are now. Um, what, what do you give credence to, to that happening and that unfolding? Is it the industry? Well, Solely yeah, I mean, or... I think one of the biggest changes was the fast food market. So McDonald's Chicken McNugget was one of the biggest factors in creating uh, an increase in consumption. And then you had Popeyes and KFC also creating buckets of fried chicken, making it readily available. And the automation of that production really changed, and the, and the um, convenience of it became really automated and, and sped up the production. So if you look at kind of the history, the creation of chicken nuggets was, chicken McNuggets was where we saw a big shift in consumption where it became readily available. Was that, was that in the seventies? Correct. Yeah. Exactly. I told you before we had this podcast, it's Colonel Sanders fault because I'm yeah, from Kentucky she, and I she saw that unfold. That, yeah. I thought it was an advertising push because of uh, the move away from beef in World War II for some reason. But I um, guess that wasn't, could have had a role. Yeah, yeah no, I, am I totally off? Was there any? Well, there, there was, during World War II, um, there was some move, but it was not, it wasn't related to beef necessarily. So there was something, vertical integration is where one company or person owns every aspect of the system from the feed to the farm, to the farmers, to the slaughterhouse, to the shipping that was invented in, in, um, really in Georgia during the depression. And it was one, um, particular person in Georgia who, um, came up with this concept. He had ran a feed mill and he was looking for ways to sell more of his feed. And he was like, Hmm, I'll maybe I'll contract farmers to, I'll drop off chickens with them and they'll have to buy my feed and this will sell more feed. And this was the beginning of the contract vertical integration system. And he was like, oh, this really works. And in North, North Georgia, where I don't live too far from there, this 
exploded. The, the industry exploded in this way. It was really successful and he raised so much money in this way. He was able to open his own slaughterhouse then. And that was the first, one of the very first uh, vertical integrated systems. You say that chicken farming started factory farming. Correct. It it was the it was really where we saw the efficiency the being the focus rather than the care for the animal and the stewardship for the animal where the, the, the steward the, the stewardship was forgotten and efficiency became the main objective. Mm -hmm. Some of the really popular terms um, <clears throat> as it relates to animal foods, but I think especially chicken and eggs. Uh, are, uh, you know, these these terms that us animal activists just roll our eyes at every single time because we know the truth behind it and what it means. But terms like organic and free range and grass fed and pasture raise and uh, my favorite hormone free, which they finally can't actually put on the packaging, <laughs> like no added hormones like, hello. Uh, but they could say that for a while. Uh, hormone free. Um, why are these terms uh, so dangerous? I think they give, so all of the terms you just named are marketing terms for the most part. They're, they're terms which are trying to convince people of the image that they want to have of how the animals are raised so that they don't think beyond the package where the animal has come from and the life and the suffering that the animal has had. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to the kind of better angel, angels of our nature, which is we yeah. want to do the right thing. We look at that package and we hope that that animal has lived a life on pasture under the sunshine, you know, foraging in the forest. That's what we want. That's what we hope for. And that marketing term is preying on those, yeah. those that, that better angel of our nature. And it works because we don't want to stop eating something that's convenient and cheap and satisfies the protein needs that we have. We just we just want to go to the grocery store and not think beyond that package. And they know that. And and there's no regulation on these terms. So there's no way to know as a consumer that, and, you, and people don't know these things aren't regulated, so there's no way to know. So for example, a very popular thing to put on meat chickens is cage-free. And people think this is great. They think, oh, this must mean the rest of them are in cages. Well wake up call no chickens are raised in cages for meat ever this is just like saying the chickens are white or the chickens have two legs it is a trick to make you feel better about what you're picking up off the grocery store shelf now uh just to be clear egg laying hens yes at least in in a lot of places are in cages and slanted cages and so their eggs will fall and they have a different a different rate and are they raised differently correct and they're that is a, a and they're preying on that right they're preying on the market confusion around that so that is where those animals are raised the the laying as i said they've kind of been divided as they're almost like subspecies now and they're different breeds if you will and they don't mix and these ones for laying eggs are raised in cages unless it says cage free or that it has been regulated in some way mm -hmm. and it's totally different and they perch and they're they're a different shape if you look at the two of them you're like these are not how are these even related they are cage free eggs are definitely a move in the right direction in terms of progress caged meat chickens don't exist it doesn't exist you you've probably been on more of the these uh <clears throat> more chicken farms than well, us combined at least, and maybe all of our listeners combined. Um, so uh, the, the the organic term, I think, is the one that the conscious consumer really leans into the most in terms of believability. Like they really think that there's some really stringent standards around that. And we do know, um, and I know especially in, in dairy farms, uh, you know, it's it, the, the USDA, um, you know, Let's the farmer know that they're going to come check out their organic farm uh, in six months from now on February 7th uh, type of thing. For chicken farms and farming, um, what are some of uh, some of the, the situations that you've seen that that our listeners who maybe are eating organic chicken would be shocked by? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I regularly have this frustration and so 
but for history, there have been huge efforts by activists to try to transform the organic standard. And I was one of them who worked for a long time to, and I gave testimony and I wrote drafts of revisions, trying to make the organic standard mean something for animals. And we got a draft passed right before um, the new administration, Trump administration. It was passed, but then it was overturned. And it was a really low moment for the for the movement because we thought finally people are buying it. They're going to keep buying it. Let's at least make it mean something for animals. And we lost that battle. So, well, what was in we, the draft? I mean, what did what did you, what was what was what did the it draft? Change? Right, the draft was so a lot of people think that there's nothing meaningful for the animals in terms of outdoor access. And that's the key thing where people think that this means the animals will have a pasture. They don't have a pasture. Sometimes all they have is a concrete slab, like a patio that they might have a door on the side of the regulations are very um, loose and not meaningful to the animals. So whether they be cows or pigs or chickens, the outdoor access is abysmal and unused because it isn't sufficient for the number of animals it isn't grass it doesn't have to be the it doesn't it can have a roof on it so they don't even have to have sunshine uh it can be a porch like setting so that to me was one of the most fundamental tricks of organic that that people thought the birds were fully outside the chickens the pigs the cows were fully outside and they're not i mean the other aspect are things like breed and space are not specified so they can be crowded um and, you know, I think that the thing is organic was in the United States has been created specifically for the environment. So it is good if you care about the environment because it thinks about the feed the animals are given and how that feed was raised and there's less pesticides being used and all of that, but it has nothing to do with the animals. In Europe, it's totally different. In Europe, the standard is a pasture-raised, free-range kind of standard, and it is regulated and it is meaningful. It's just in the United States, it's not. Can hmm. you talk about a lot of people who um, want to be good to animals, they'll give up red meat and say, uh, but I still eat chicken. Mm -hmm. And they think it's healthier. And mm -hmm. uh, will you please explain why chicken actually might be the least healthy in, in, in so many ways. Um, it's one of my biggest frustrations and I have family members who are doing that, but I also think like to the listeners who do eat meat and who are on that journey, keep going. It's not a judgment. Every step is a step in the right direction. And if you're eating less cows and pigs then great, keep going, keep moving in that direction. But to think that somehow that chickens are healthier or less deserving in some way because they are um, a bird rather than a mammal, I think that is problematic. And the number one cause of food poisoning, and this is not, this was a University of Florida um, epidemiology study, of number one cause of food poisoning in the United States is chicken. And the reason is, that chickens are raised in horrifically crowded condition living on their own feces. So it's called litter. It's not really litter. It's not like a guinea pig's litter. It's a bunch of shavings that have been pooped on over many, many flocks, over many, many years, and then combed over, and then more chickens are put on top. People think that that litter is changed. It's never changed. Many farmers I talk to don't change it for years. So then the chicken are pecking and pecking and pecking, living on this. This is getting in their gut. Then they go to slaughter. The slaughter is done so fast that the gut contents, including Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, are getting on the meat. So the industry solution to this is, is a lot of educative material on cook your meat well, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality is it's not working because chicken still is the number one cause of food poisoning. I will say I have had Campylobacter, but not from eating chickens, but from hanging out with live ones in an industrial setting. And I thought I was going to die. I don't know if either one of you have had it, but I had dysentery from it, which is a horrific situation. I had to go on antibiotics. I lost like 
15 pounds in a week. It's unbelievable. And this is because the animals are living in such a horrific condition. Uh, so it's not healthy in, in, in a sort of food poisoning sense, but it's also not providing, the chickens we eat today are have more fat content than protein content. People think that this is a lean meat, but these are obese animals. These animals have been, they're essentially obese babies and we're eating obese babies full of fat. And a lot of the meat now is breaking down and sort of the muscular content of these animals is starting to uh, almost disintegrate because of the muscular disease they have from growing so fast. There's nothing about this that is healthy or even appetizing if that appeals to you. It's unhealthy, it's disease ridden. These are birds that are very unhealthy. I mean, if you are what you eat, this is not something, someone that you want to be eating. And they also, um, to make the chickens look plumper, uh, the meat, don't they inject them with a lot of salt before they package them? Yeah, and you can, that's a great point. You can look on the packages and sometimes you can see that. So if you see like um, sodium chloride water and then chicken, you should know that that chicken has been injected with salt water to plump it up and make it look and taste better than it actually is. Cause it doesn't really taste like anything anymore. And if you talk to people who are like, Oh, back in the day, my chicken used to taste like something. Now it's just rubber and we season it. It's just a conduit for flavors. Part of the part of the problem is, is the kind of breeding we, we do with them. Um, could you talk about arsenic and gangrenous dermatitis and also how chickens <sighs> uh, in terms of pandemics? are yeah. so vulnerable. Such lovely subjects, such lovely appetizing, <laughs> fun subjects. Yeah. Um, Our engineers look riveted over there with this. I know. <laughs> like, <they're> like, ew! <laughs> 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 well, gangrenous dermatitis is something I became very familiar with after I was working with some farmers in West Virginia. So these farmers came to me, they were working for Pilgrim's Pride, which is one of the largest chicken companies in the world. And they said, we went out, we hate this industry, but they're trapped in debt. And they said, but we have, we have a huge disease problem in this county. And at the time I couldn't go into the farms. They had a policy that people like me couldn't go in. So I left cameras with the actual farmers and they went in and filmed. And what came out of that film was a disease called gang gangrenous dermatitis. And this is where it's, it's like gangrene. So a bacteria gets in the birds and it eats them from the inside out. And it happens very fast. It happens around the end of their flock cycle, which is around five or six weeks. And they turn into this, it's disgusting. It's just like a gelatinous greenish purple color. And they're just flat inside. And the birds are all stepping on top of them, the dead ones, pecking at them. And then they get it. And then a whole, you'll have 400, 500. So they, the birds, the farmers would tell me overnight, there would be four or 500 birds that would get this. And they would all die this horrible death. Now, because it's at the end of the flock, no doubt some of these birds, and this is, this is not just me saying this, but definitively studied, are going to slaughter with this disease and then being put on people's plates. No doubt. Gangrenous dermatitis is one of the most common problems in the industry as depicted by them, the industry. And so no doubt this is, they're just trying to get them faster and faster onto our plates, cutting corners where they can, trying to make money where they can. And no doubt this is getting onto our plates. Um, arsenic is less used now, but was given to birds in feed. And some states have made this illegal now. And they put it in feed to the industry put this arsenic into feed and everybody knows arsenic is bad, like bad. And they put it in feed to help. They thought this made the birds grow faster and it did. It turns out that it made the birds grow. And, but what was happening is it's, it was in the birth, both in the meat of the birds, but then also in the chicken poop that then got spread onto the land as fertilizer. And then into our soil, into our water, into our food that we're growing on this land. There's nothing good about it. And then you take the current situation we're in, in a pandemic, and we have been really clear. We're just lucky right now, frankly. I know we think this is a horrible situation, but we have some very serious viruses that exist within avian flocks, within chicken flocks, avian flu, that are highly pathogenic, that just haven't quite figured out yet how to pass well between humans or chickens and humans. 
but they exist and scientists are very concerned about them and watching them very closely. And many people say, many experts, scientists, scientific experts say it's a matter of when, not if we have a pandemic coming out of a chicken farm or a pig farm. And there's a lot of evidence that we've just about missed it a couple times. So this really should be a wake up call for, it's not a wake up call. This is the, this is the call, it's, it's happening right now. And the best thing we could do would be undoing factory farming right now to protect ourselves in every possible way. This, I hope there is a, you know, we all talk about a new normal we want after this. I hope there's a new normal for farmed animals too, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. You you just uh, spoke about at the beginning of that story, the farmers, you know, who came to you and said, we want out. We don't want to mm -hmm. do this anymore. Um, I think you mentioned they're in debt. Um, so for uh, the listener um, that doesn't really understand the just the entire um, you know circle that is uh, a lot of you know main uh, meat agriculture, right? Not just chickens, but um, what that circle looks like from uh, the big corporations down to let's just even say the medium-sized chicken farm. You don't even have to go small. Um, what is happening? to that chicken farmer? Yeah. So a lot of people think that farmers are independent, chicken farmers are independent, growing chickens on their own. It's it's absolutely not how it works in this country at all. And it doesn't work that way in India. It doesn't work that in Brazil. It's not just here. So just to give a real example, Craig Watts is somebody I worked with in North Carolina. And when he was about 22 years old, the chicken industry, he wanted to stay on the land. He had five generations of his family. He had the deed from the queen of England, from his aunt. He wanted to stay on the land. He had, he wanted to have kids. He wanted to have a life here, but there were no jobs because it was the poorest county in rural North Carolina. So when the chicken industry rolled into town and said, we got, we got a job for you, raise chickens for us, just sign on the dotted line. You just have to borrow half a million dollars from the bank, but don't worry, we got that set up for you. You just go to the bank, sign on the dotted line. We got, we got it all set for you. Now, the only way that he could pay off this loan is to keep raising chickens for the chicken company. Now, these are huge loans, like a mortgage that you get, but this is poor rural South Carolina. He's got a half a million dollar loan. Literally the only way to pay this off is to keep raising chickens. If he stops raising chickens, he loses everything ev that he got into it in the first place, the land, the home, yeah. this land that has been passed down for generations in his family. So he's gonna raise chickens and really pays off that debt. And it goes fine at first, but then things start to go wrong because it's a chicken factory farm, the birds get sick, he starts to lose money and he realizes he's made this horrible mistake. But now we refer to them as indentured servants. He has no choice but to keep doing this. So this is typical throughout thousands of chicken farmers. There are, in the industry, there are no independent chicken farmers. They're all contracted by big industry. So this is Purdue, Tyson, Foster Farms. They contract farmers. They, they completely outsource the risk. Yeah. So if the chicken industry thought this was a money maker, they would take it on. But instead they outsource the one part that is risky and costs money and is, is just gonna lose money, which is raising the chickens and the waste. So the farmers are also responsible for all of that chicken feces and what to do with it. They get fined if something goes wrong. They have to get the permits. They have to be responsible for that waste. And if the chickens die, they're the ones who don't get paid. The chicken industry is like, you didn't do something right. Yeah. Even though they have no control over the types of breeds, the conditions or anything. Because the so chicken really industry- horrible system. The chicken industry sends them the chickens and sometimes Correct. they're just, uh, they've been bred only to be big, not to be healthy. Oh, absolutely. They're not robust at all. So, and, and the farmers can do very little to work on that. So even farmers who really want to make a difference, they can't give them outdoor access. That's not allowed. They can't give them windows. They can't give them more space because it's very specified, this amount of space. They can't give them perches. They can't give them extra food or different, and they can't afford any way to, if they wanted to give them antibiotics, they can't give them many times medicines. They're not going to individually treat 30,000 chickens. It's just, it's a terrible system that really doesn't really think about the individual animals, but it also doesn't set up a farmer for success. Mm -hmm. So your book, Grilled, is, um, you know, the story of when we 
you cross enemy lines and, and look for solutions. Uh, you realized at some point that potentially the way uh, to pressure uh, the chicken companies uh, to change, to make big change, um, is uh, to, to, to maybe change the, the largest companies first, right? Like the Tyson and Purdue. Um, and I love the story in the book, which we'll talk about when you met Jim Purdue for the first time. Um, but tell us about uh, the, the Leah before that. <laughs> what led you to think that this was going to be a way forward? Well, um, to be honest, the first time I went to see Craig Watts, that was not my intention. Craig Watts is the chicken factory farmer who really changed my course. I was going in there to get footage and get out because there had not been any footage collected from a chick inside of a chicken factory farm for a decade. The and the collective animal rights movement had been trying, but it was really hard. Ag gag was ever present and growing and it was very challenging. So I saw this opportunity and this farmer said, you know, yeah, come and film. And I was like, heck yeah, we're gonna go and get that footage and get out. And then I got there, you know, my intention going there, the, the Leah before that really, you know, I had curiosity about the other side. I have, a, you know, I have a father who is a nuclear power plant creator. Like he creates nuclear power plants when I was growing up and I used to argue with him. I was a Greenpeace, like, you know, advocate. And I have a uh, an uncle who is, um, creates weapons for Lockheed Martin. And I have another uncle who drills oil. And I have another uncle who's a hunter and a, you know, butcher. We had a lot of interesting conversations growing up, you know, and I knew these people were at their heart, like they're all good people. They're all people I love and are kind. And I think I somewhere buried in me that was there knowing this person, there was a good element to them. And I just had to connect and figure that part out. And maybe we could create a path together through that commonality. So what I'm hearing so, is you're saying that you wanted to change the system and to do that, you needed to meet the people. Yeah. And I had to hear him. So when I got there, whereas I intended to just get footage and get out, I started to hear his story and understand the root of the problem. And I felt like I had to keep going back and back and back and back. Why did he make the decision to be a chicken farmer? And if I could figure that out and stop that from happening, mm -hmm then none of this would exist. And the reason he chose that was because there were no other choices and he wanted to stay on the land. He didn't want to kill chickens every day. He wanted to have a way of life in rural America that had been in his family for a long time. So that was his rationale, not he's an evil person who wants to you know, slaughter chickens and hurt them every day. And listening and meeting that person was critical to me understanding that. Mm -hmm. That's a big jump though from, from Watts to Jim Perdue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that. <laughs> yeah. So so then your journey of, OK, now you've met this farmer. Now you really are recognizing and realizing um, the the stress and the, um, you know, constraints that he's in if he doesn't want to just completely go under and, and, and lose the land. And so then do you start unraveling that route, <laughs> the people that put him in that situation? Yeah. And that, again, put me in really unfamiliar territory. I didn't even know I was going to meet Jim Perdue the day I met Jim Perdue. And he just was there when I was being given a tour. There he was just suddenly there in the lobby of a hotel. And the initial conversation with Perdue was they wouldn't speak to me for about two years after I came out with an expose with Craig. And then over time, we were able to forge a relationship because we had a couple conversations where we realized, okay, 80% of what we're talking about, we can agree on. There's a 20% really important part that we don't agree on, but let's just put that 20% aside and let's see if we can make full progress on the 80%. And what I came to understand about Purdue is at the end of the day, they have to pay shareholders, they have to pay, not shareholders, they have to pay employees, they have a bottom line, they're a family business and their concept, and Jim Perdue said this to me, he said, we're a premium protein company. And, and he later said, nothing about that says we have to do chickens. And this was like a, a light bulb moment for me. Like all they wanna do is make money and feed people protein. 
imagine that we convince them to of what's left of their chicken they raise it very high welfare and they move slowly more and more and more towards plant-based protein and believe it or not they are doing that now it was just this remarkable arch that i went on with them from where i exposed them as the devil you know incarnate here to ones we were sitting down and talking about them doing blended products and plant-based proteins it was incredible so what what is the 80 percent that you agree on that's a lot yeah and the 80 percent was so at mercy for animals we have this concept of we want to build a compassionate food system mm -hmm. and we think there's two steps to that. And the first is we wanna reduce the suffering of the animals that are trapped in the system for the near future. While we move towards a plant-based economy, mm -hmm. totally plant-based. Um, and we could agree that it is our job, both of our jobs, Purdue and our jobs, to reduce the suffering of animals. And that every opportunity we have we should be reducing their suffering. If we see a chance to do it, we should go for it. So that means giving them more space, giving them light, giving them a breed that doesn't cause inherent suffering. And so we should move towards that. And I get questioned a lot in my work about this approach. And the analogy I often use is imagine you were a prisoner in a horrible, horrible, horrible prison, crowded, dirty, dark, dank, on death row, would you want someone only advocating for the end of your death sentence only, or also improving your prison conditions while advocating for the end of your death sentence? You would want both. And that's what the animals want us to do. And that's how I look at it. So the 80% is this ending the suffering. You might think it's 50%, but I actually think it's 80%. That's like a big piece of work. Oh, I don't think it's not, but you you said the 80% was what you and Purdue agreed on. They agree with you on all of this? They do agree on that. Okay. And they are and the the part that is the real challenge is how to still stay in business while doing that. Right? So, and that was the kind of that's when you're sitting down, you can't just, when you're sitting down with a business, with a big company, you can't just say like, I don't care. No, sure. We just have to stop doing this. So with them, it was like, we agree with you. These breeds are problematic. We would like to give them more space. And they have year on year, believe it or not, committed to more space, more outdoor. So right now, a quarter of their chickens have outdoor access. And this is an increase. They have I think 30% have windows. So they're in incrementally moving towards this suffering reduction. Mm -hmm. And they are stuck on some things, which we harp on them. They, like they will not change the breed because it, they said it's going to cost so much money to change the breed. And we're like, yeah, that's why you can't keep doing chickens. You need to start doing plant-based. You need to commit to the higher welfare and move towards the plant-based because the economy, our land and the suffering of the animals cannot sustain this. It's a, it's an, what we're trying, I guess, to get to with the industry in many ways is to a point where they go, we agree, we need to reduce the suffering. These animals shouldn't suffer like this and then realize it's an unsolvable problem mm -hmm. and that they can't raise animals like this. Mm -hmm. And then we have, and it's too much money, but they know it's wrong and they move to this other product, which is the plant-based protein. That's the kind of path, but you can't force someone onto that path. They have to evolve as a business into that path. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 no doubt uh, that the large chicken companies are marketing <laughs> the terms we talked about earlier, using those marketing terms to prey on the goodness of people. Um, and you said earlier that we are eating more chickens than we ever have. So how do we know that this isn't just convincing people to eat more chicken? Yeah. And it's something I keeps me up at night. You know, yeah. it, I worry about it. And I, I always, um, I talk about, and I, I know Alexandra, you care a lot about this human population growth as being one of the like really, <laughs> I know I watched your TED talk too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the only thing that's more unpopular than not eating animals <laughs> is human population. She well, picked it. <laughs> well, you know, if we look that's why. Mm -hmm. So even if individuals, that is why we're eating more mm -hmm. animals than ever before right now, because so we've done like mathematical models, right? Where we look at 
by 2050, there's going to be almost 10 billion people. Okay, so let's say we want to reduce the number, the per capita consumption of animals by 2050. By so we have, let's say we're eating, we're eating a certain amount. Uh, I, f- I forget how many we're eating now. I think it's 70 billion. Let's say we're eating 70 billion animals per year right now. What if we want to have that to 35 billion by 2050 mm-hmm. when there are so many more people on the planet? So 50% less than today. Would that mean we each have to eat 50% less? No. In the United States, that actually means we'd have to eat 90% less. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's a huge effort because there's going to be, the, it's, it's a confounding problem. It's not just that. It's also that there's, there's so many more humans that are living better than ever before. So they're eating more protein and chicken is unfortunately the low hanging animal that's easy to replicate globally. We have a huge problem and a huge effort. So yes, you know, for me, the thing that I have hope in is that, is that we are running out of air. I mean, this is a terrible hope, but we're running out of arable land Mm -hmm. and it's going to be a math problem at some point where we go, this is a really stupid way to raise our food. We're wasting our land to raise soy and maize and grains to raise animals in a farm to then feed ourselves. Let's just skip that part and only raise the ant, the, sorry, only raise the feed, the feed for ourselves, use that land to feed ourselves. And that, I think we're, we're going to come to that sooner than unfortunately we like in many ways, because it's going to become a panic situation where we're going, you know, there's in, in England, they're saying there's 60 harvests left of the land and we have to use it much more intelligently than we are if we're going to feed 10 billion people and the trajectories as you know are that we are going to be 10 billion people yeah yeah um this is the same issue that the climate change people are facing we're we're being asked to lower our uh, output of uh, greenhouse gases yet the population is getting bigger and people are living a higher quote-unquote higher quality of life which uses more energy you have a really good analogy you mentioned one before but you have a really good analogy in the book about henry ford versus henry berg um and i thought that that was really apt as we move into the next phase of our conversation about what's possible in terms of food. Can you share with our audience that story? Yeah. So Henry Berg started the ASPCA and um, he was passionate. The ASPCA is, is protects animals, right? So it's a household name, I hope, but the concept for that there's a, this is the tale of two Henry's is how I like to talk about it. Um, and Henry Berg, he was an advocate for horses and he passed some of the, and he advocated and passed some of the first laws to protect horses because they were be, being used in horse and buggies in these perfectly cruel circumstances. They were beat, they were whipped and it was horrible. So he advocated for this, but then along came around the same time, Henry Ford, Henry Ford created the automobile and it was really the automation of transportation through Henry Ford that accelerated, accelerated and ended the need for the horse and buggy. So we had the kind of moral versus the technological and Mm -hmm. we have that happening now. The only, the only thing I would caveat that with, we had that happening with the fact that we have a moral argument not to eat animals. And then we have technological advances where you have plant-based proteins and we have um, clean meat or cultivated meat where meat is being grown in labs so that, or in breweries so that we can just eat it. And I don't know if your listeners are gonna be too familiar with that, but the concept is technology versus morals for meat too. Yeah. and. I will say that I think that we need both right now because of how difficult this problem, because of the confounding factors we have here and the growing population. The world was very different when the two Henrys existed. And something very wonderful is happening right now. If you think about impossible meat and beyond meat and all of these plant-based proteins that are emerging, they have the most incredible marketing army out there in the world in the form of mercy for animals and all these other organizations that are like free marketing 
rallying for them to survive, thrive, and just win. And that has never happened in history. The only time it's happened is the opposite, like soda, where NGOs and nonprofits come and fight against something. This is the opposite. We're all rallying for the success of a market product. And that makes me so excited about the speed at which we can move together towards the solution. Mm -hmm. That's Dati, what you're doing in terms of alternative milks and yeah, you know, same promoting fight, same fight, different same, animal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell us about your, your book ends with a very optimistic view about how we can not only help these farmers who, by the way, one of the things I was shocked at was they only make 5% of what off every chicken that they, that they mm -hmm. raise, yeah, no, according to Leah's book. And also what happens is as soon as they start to pay out, really pay down their debt, the the industry, the, the, the chicken company to whom they are beholden and for whom they provide chickens, asks them to make upgrades. And then they have to do another loan. And so this becomes this really like indentured servitude, mm -hmm. like you said. So we have a real opportunity to get the farmers off off the, off the, 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 the milk teat, the chicken teat, all these different um, addictions that, that the industry that financially they're addicted to and also as we get consumers off too so can you share some of the ideas you have in your book yeah um well one of the ideas we're actually carrying out now so that was like a 2050 i vision but one of them is these farmers have stopped factory farming have transitioned to plant-based products so they've repurposed their houses for other things like mushrooms and hemp and craig watts who is the subject of this book, a, a lot of it, is now raising, is doing mushrooms. It's so exciting. We have a transformation project at Mercy for Animals and we're piloting with five farmers. And we are, like I said at the beginning, like Craig Watts wants to stay on the land because he needs to make money to stay there. So we're trying to problem solve that. So we're working with five farmers who are doing hemp and mushrooms, different farmers, and finding ways for them to make money and stay on the land. Those long warehouses are good for raising hemp and mushrooms. It's fantastic. And my, you know, my vision is a world where Mercy for Animals shuts down and we have big parties and we celebrate the end of a horrible food system that was a huge mistake. And in the book, I kind of vision going camping with my grandkids and looking at a dilapidated factory farm and saying, oh, and they go, what is that? And I say, oh, that was just a terrible, brief mistake we made as humans, where for a second, we thought that was a very good way to make protein. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that is a really dumb way to make protein. We can do it in so many more innovative, compassionate, and clean ways than that. And we left it. And that that's where we're moving towards. And I'm, mm -hmm. I am an optimistic person. I believe we will get there. Mm -hmm. Do you help those farmers with their distribution models too? Because it's it's um that's the at, at the end of the day, right? They have to they have to know exactly where it's going and who's going to buy it before they ever even start planting. Yeah, you're right. That is the very hardest part. But we are working with a hemp company. Uh, that's probably the easier one than the mushroom. The mushroom is we're finding a little more difficult. But hemp mm -hmm. is a really growing industry, and I'm not just talking about CBD oil, but um, all the textiles yeah. and hemp is being used for plastics. Um, and we're interested in working with some dairy farmers up in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of farmers that want to get out and the distribution part is the hardest aspect. We struggled with that with Craig for a little while. Um, and we're figuring it out. I, I, we don't have all the answers, but we're certainly piloting modeling and want to share the learning so that more and more farmers can get on board with it. Right. Right. What about the chicken companies? Uh, you talked about them getting into the uh, plant protein business and moving away from the animal protein business. Are they doing this in a substantial manner? I know a lot of them have invested in plant-based mm -hmm. companies, but are they actually moving away from animals? Time will tell whether they, I think... If, if it's a successful enough aspect of their business. So I think we've got two competing models right now um, where you've got companies emerging that are solely plant-based like Beyond or Impossible or um, Rebellious is another one, Rebellious Foods, uh, or ones that are emerging within Tyson, within Purdue. 
and time will tell which one succeeds. I think if we can convince the Tysons and the producers of the world, it will be faster because they have all the machines already. Those like the extruder to create a chicken nugget cost a million dollars and they have a bunch of them already making chicken. So why don't we swap it out for plant-based and hopefully never use it again for animals. That that's kind of where I would like us to go, but we have to, it has to make enough money for them. The market has to shift enough. The demand has to shift enough for them to be convinced. And they often say that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's complex and time will tell which one works. Mm -hmm. What is your theory of change around, um, human beings cons consumption of, um, the smaller animals like, like chicken and fish, right? We kill the most of them. Um, uh, but people like them a lot and they don't necessarily feel that significantly different if they take them out of their diet. Um, so what's your theory of change around just convincing human beings to stop eating it? That's a great question. And I think that the plant-based products have to become cheap enough and similar enough in taste mm. and texture and people will choose them. And I think some of them are close, but not there yet. And I know, for example, the company I mentioned, Rebellious, is really working on that model, making it the same. The price is the biggest factor with chicken in particular, yeah. and we have not achieved that yet. We have not, you know, if you look at Gardein, delicious, those you know, the tenders that they make are delicious, but they are way more expensive yeah. than regular chicken. So the average American is not going to pick them up unless they're already moving in that direction. So what we need to do is where Impossible or Beyond have put products right in the meat shelf, right next to those products, and the price is coming down and down and down. That's what we need to do with chicken too. I think making it equivalent in price in texture and taste mm -hmm. and familiar as a product is the the closest we're going to get, I think, and hopefully that making more money for the companies will eventually help them move in that production model into that production model as well. Mm -hmm. So more about the replacements necessarily than teaching them about chickens. Yeah, I. So I was just using this analogy with a coworker today who was very frustrated and upset because her dad had. Um, she had, she had been, um, had learned she has an autoimmune disease and she's vegan. She's been vegan for a long time. And her dad said, well, maybe you should eat meat. And she got so mad because she was like, I can't believe it. You know, why doesn't he understand? You know, and I, I totally get this and anger. We feel like, why can't people understand how much we, this is morally wrong to kill a sentient being. Why don't they understand? And we talked through it and I said, it's like, we have a toolbox full of amazing tools, but instead as advocates, we're just pulling, like we have a, we have a blower and a saw and we have, you know, a hammer and nails and a screwdriver and, and then I don't know, an ice pick. And we decide to only pick out the screwdriver. The screwdriver is care about animals for moral reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think it is, doesn't matter to the animals, which tool we're using. And we have to go back to that. What do the animals need? They need us to use any tool in the toolbox so that people stop eating them. So I don't believe we need, and I don't think we ever will convince everyone to care about animals. And I wish I could get everyone to care about Henrietta and all chickens, believe me, I've tried. But I've moved through my advocacy over time to realize use all the tools because luckily, this industry is terrible for so many reasons. So we should use all the tools, whichever is applicable to whichever keyhole we need to get into, whichever door we need to get into to get people to change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that that's hard to accept when you care so much about the animals sometimes, and it's hard to let go of that. And I, the way I get over that is I think about an individual chicken. What would she want me to do? She won't care if somebody stops eating her because they care about their health or the environment or the price she, she will only care that they stop eating her mm -hmm. well that brings us full circle to what we were talking about how so many different ways to help animals and all of them are valuable and thank you for the ways that you have helped and are helping and will continue to help animals 
Leah Garces. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. No, oh, it's my honor. I love Switch for Good, by the way. I live in Atlanta and I, I see kids walking around with the soccer jerseys yeah. <laughs> that say the Switch for Good soccer all over it, my neighborhood. And I think of you all and I think, oh my gosh, if you can reach into Atlanta, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that earlier today, yeah, weren't we? It's so yeah, great. Thanks. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much. It's really illuminating. And love the book. Everybody get the book. Grilled. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>